Next, we're going to switch to a discussion with, again, our leader from the College of ACES, College of uh, Agriculture here at the University of Illinois. The revered dean of the college is Dean Kim Kidwell, and she serves on the board of the Research Park and helps guide us for our future of how we can work better with industry, launch new startup companies. I hope you enjoyed seeing some that have come out of your own college. And um, she is also helping us with new facilities and capabilities on campus. One of those companies that has helped us um, continue to provide new jobs and think about the potential of agriculture is Corteva, which has actually two sites here. Sam is no stranger to the University of Illinois. In fact, he has three degrees from here. So I'm sure Dean Kidwell can tell you more about Sam and his links to the university. Take us away, Dean Kidwell. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Laura. Sam, I, I just hope we can contain ourselves. We know each other pretty well, so this will be a fun <laughs> opportunity for us to be able to chat. So uh, you have a long history here at University of Illinois and some legacy, too, with uh, with a niece that's too, still here that actually works uh, in my office. And so I've really appreciated having the time to connect with you as dean. So we've talked about a lot of things over the time that I've met you. And you know, one thing that I've always really appreciated about you is innovation could be well be your middle name. You know, you've really been um, a progressive thinker in this field. And you know, I keep telling Laura, I give her credit for this. I, I call this this summit the art of possible. So if you're willing, um, tell us a bit about your background and how some of the art of possible actually guided your career and, and actually uh, is framing the goals for what you have in your role of, as Chief Technology Officer for Corteva. Well, great. Well, Kim, it's a, it's a pleasure to chat with you and it's a pleasure to be back at the uh, Ag Tech Summit this year. I, I think last year, this might have been my last event I did out in the public before COVID sort of shut everything down. Um, so it's kind of a, been a crazy year and a lot of things have changed for all of us. Um, you know, I, as I think about my, my career a little bit, my, my background, for those who don't know, I, I grew up in Illinois, um, grew up on a farm still in West Central Illinois, brothers still farm there today, and um, had a chance to go to the University of Illinois, and my, my intentions were to go back home and farm, and got an opportunity to experience plant breeding and, and see, you know, kind of what a plant breeder does, and how they manipulate uh, plants and the genetic variability for what we want in society and humans um, fell in love with that. So decided to stick around the uh, stick around campus there a little bit longer and get a degree in plant breeding and genetics. I've uh, been very fortunate in my career uh, as I've worked out in the private sector uh, to really help drive innovation in uh, plant breeding and, and how we bring new technology, you know, whether it's uh, new screening techniques or DNA based selection programs. Uh, new ways to sample plants uh, all throughout uh, all, you know, the last decade or so and really changing plants that way. And then, you know, spending some time on digital. And how do you think about data that's coming in from, from our farming community and using that data to really answer some of the impossible questions we've all struggled with in agriculture for a long time and turning around and making that into something that's actionable for, for growers. Um, but about a year ago, I had an opportunity to join Corteva as their CTO, and um, it's been a great transition uh, for, for me and, and loving the company, loving the fact that we were a pure play ag company. We get up every day and think about agriculture, and, and uh, you know, we have an incredible uh, pipeline that we're bringing to farmers to give them choice and, and bring some of that innovation out into the marketplace. Very good, very good. Do you think about when you think about you know the future as we go forward as as a new person to your role, how much does your dream about what's going to happen next impact how you shape goals for the company? Uh, I think a lot about what the future could be. Uh, it's usually how I approach every every problem or situation is, you know, let's imagine what this could be in five years or ten years and work ourselves backwards to what would we need to solve? What would we need to figure out or, or do? Um, how would we then do that? What, what collaborations might we put in place? What innovation do we have to go create and solve? And um, you know, use that to really set up, okay, you know, here's a 10 year plan and how do we go after you know, getting something done? 
And then, you know, making sure we get the really crisp milestones along the way to say, are we, are we getting there? Or are we coming up short or are we ahead of pace? You know, we're, we're solving these problems faster than we thought, uh, or are there some, you know, big barriers and we need to go rethink the problem. And, you know, that was you know, something I tell everybody in, you know, in the science field, I think most of you know this, right? You have your hypothesis and you, you design the right experiments and you put it together and test it and, and you figure out if you're right or wrong. And, you know, I think that was very true in the early days of molecular breeding. We, we all had some pretty clear views of how we thought it should work. And, you know, I think we had it partially right. Uh, we had to kind of reset and adjust and change some of our thinking. And then, of course, as new technology came along in that space and it let us really approach the problem in different ways. Um, you ultimately created a better solution than what you even imagined when you started. So um, let the data direct where you're going to go, but really kind of, you know, start with what's the vision and imagine what it could be. I appreciate that. As a, as a fellow plant breeder, I completely align with your philosophy. Um, let's talk a little bit about chemistry. So, you know, chemistry sometimes gets a, a really bad rap and, you know, often, especially from people that don't fully understand purpose, how it works, uh, things like that. From your perspective, how do you actually change that kind of mindset around, uh, around technology to really show the power of chemistry and how it can create positive change, especially in our current context? Yeah, and you know, for me, you know, that's actually, uh, as I joined Corteva, and Corteva has an incredible history with the heritage companies of um, chemistry and agriculture, uh, delivering that uh, innovation that's needed. And, um, you know, that was, be be quite honest, that was new for me. You know, I'm a, I'm a plant breeder, you know, I know plants at the end of the day, and I, I remember my organic chemistry classes at the University of Illinois, but I, I won't profess to have been an expert by any means. And um, uh, but but the last couple of months, I've, I've had a chance to really dig into what do we do and how do we do it and why do we do it and what are we working on. And I, I've actually been incredibly impressed and amazed at uh, some of the thinking that was done in in the company. Uh, it is setting up what I'll call really sustainable chemistry sort of philosophies at the end of the day, right? And, and, and to your point, you know, unfortunately, there's a you know, fairly significant sort of anti-chemistry or fear of chemistry developing in a lot of places. But, you know, I would challenge most people to really stop and look at your personal life and say, how would it be without chemistry? It would probably be quite different. Um, and that's very true for, for farmers, right? I look at what we what we're faced with on the farm and uh, you know if we didn't have that tool in you know the toolbox it'd be pretty tough to be out there farming in, in a lot of ways uh, and it doesn't matter whether you're running you know you know a small farm of you know a few hundred acres to you know hundreds of thousands of acres at the other day um, what i like about some of the direction and again i think this is where we we, we can change the narrative and and reposition it's not chemistry is not bad it's really a necessary tool and but how do we you know go ahead and 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 make it a little bit more sustainable and um, what it is and so for example um the amount of active that you you put on a field right i mean when i, when I was a kid it wasn't uncommon we we put on pounds of active in some of our cornfields to control weeds uh, you know it's not uncommon for a lot of herbicides out there, you know, kilograms, you know, per hectare application rates. You know, we, we have uh, products now that are just launching and some more in the pipeline. We're, we're down to like grams per hectare uh, of how much active is being put out there. Uh, you look at um, formulations that are based on uh, building blocks that are far more sustainable and safer than what we've used in the past. Um, how we manufacture, I mean, green chemistry technology and, and the fact that you can produce stuff in a, in a better way, uh, you can really see that. And, and we have a lot of natural products. We have a lot of naturally inspired products uh, in, in our portfolio. So I, I do think you can look forward and say, you know, chemistry actually can be the sustainable component of agriculture. It actually might be one of the shining stars of sustainable agriculture at the end of the day. So. Um, I think it's important we all kind of get informed, kind of get to that common ground of what we're trying to accomplish. 
and uh, educate ourselves about it. And I, I think, you know, like me, I was kind of surprised. You know, I learned a lot there that I, I just didn't know and uh, can see even bigger opportunities of where we take this you know, going forward. So um, it's kind of neat to see. Uh, and I uh, just encourage people to get informed about it. You know, I heard you say two things there. One, those foundational courses you take at University of Illinois can serve you well your whole career. They can. There you go. Organic <laughs> chemistry, I battled as well. And so it's good to know that it's resurrected in your life. You know, the other piece that comes up for me when you talk about that is how important really good scientific communication is. You know, supporting people in, in really looking at data, being able to interpret data and making informed decisions. Yeah, you know, I'm curious, we haven't talked about this much, but how important is the science communication uh, portfolio and approach for the company? Yeah, it's, it's, it's critical. Um, and I'd say it's a, a learning process for all of us. Um, you know, how do you, how do you best convey the message and, and relate it to, you know, in this case, say consumers who are ultimately, you know, maybe the ultimate judge of what we're doing. Um, and, and I think there's some learnings for us in the, the scientific community and maybe even challenge ourselves a little bit, right? I, I'm always a person that jumps to the data, you know, tell me the data, show me what it says, tell me, you know, how the experiment was done, um, you know, what's the quality, the power, and, and I'll make an informed decision about whether I believe your interpretation and your hypothesis, you know, are really true. You know, that's not the majority of, of the population, right? You know, the scientists were, were kind of in the minority in that, in that perspective. And, and, and you see us still wanting to do that today, right? There will be a, a question about something or maybe a challenge, a different view comes up, and we tend to want to jump to, well, here's all the data that proves it. And I think we need to ask ourselves, is there a different way, a better way to connect with consumers, uh, a better way to hear what they're saying and you know, have that discussion about what are we trying to accomplish here, right? I mean, a great example, I just had this conversation earlier today. Uh, it was about you know, what's going on in Europe with food to fork and, and some of the philosophy there. And, and you know, at the same time, we're trying to reduce the use of synthetic chemistry, but we also want the reduction of greenhouse gases. And, and you find yourself in this sort of situation where, hey, the, the application of this chemistry, which is extremely safe and useful, enables us to reduce greenhouse gases far faster than anything else. So there's no you know, perfect solution out there, but you gotta make that choice and trade off. And so how do you communicate that? How do you get somebody to understand that, you know, this is really the best decision uh, for us as society overall, given what we're trying to accomplish? So uh, I think that the communication strategy is key, and it's probably important for all of us to really stop and think about the best way to reach uh, consumers, and it's probably not to reach for that pile of data uh, as our first response. Very good, duly noted. You know, speaking of communication, there, there are many people uh, involved in the summit that are entrepreneurs, very innovative. They have startup companies. I know you develop a lot of your own uh, technology or, at Corteva, and I also know that you license technology. If somebody's gonna approach you with an idea, what, what's, what's the best way they can communicate with you in a way that gets you intrigued or curious and pursue that conversation with them? Yeah, and first, you, you know, you're spot on. We're uh, we're very much looking for how to bring that outside innovation into the company. It's, you know, I always tell people there's, I think the uh, investment this last year was a little over 26 billion in ag tech uh, funding. Um, you know, it's, it's significantly more than my budget the other day. So um, we're, we're always looking for uh, that innovation and, and creative thinking and, and insights uh, to be brought into the company and what we can provide to a lot of the startups or new companies are we can scale stuff, we have access to customers, uh, we can put things together uh, that might be difficult for them to do as a, as a smaller company, for example. I, I What I'd tell you is, you know, we got a number of avenues uh, to connect uh, into our organization, but the, the most important thing I tell people and is, you know, tell me why I care, right? And, and show me some proof that your hypothesis is real. Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of, I, 
I get tired of what I'll call the Hollywood uh, slide deck, uh, where there's a bunch of fancy pictures that makes it look nice. And, um, you know, okay, that's great. Now let's get down to, in this case, what is the data? And what do you know? What do you not know? What are you trying to figure out? And, and why do we care about it? And so, you know, get me down to those facts is the best way to get my attention. Mm -hmm. Sam, is there a magic formula that would, would tip you one way or the other? We're going to develop this internally or we're going to seek it outside. Is, is that happenstance or is that formulated? You know, we do a lot of work on valuations of every sort of internal research project. We, we have a very strong process that uh, goes across the R&D commercial and our, our platform teams to say, what, what could be the value of this to farmers and therefore um, our shareholders at the end of the day? Uh, and of course, we're going to tend to look at, you know, like any company, what are the biggest targets and what do we spend our money after to, to go after those, uh, which leaves a lot of space for things that are still quite important, uh, but, you know, we, we don't have the capacity to invest in or develop uh, on our own. So we'll, we'll definitely seek out in all those areas um, where we can, you know, partner where we can bring something in from the outside and uh, you know, let somebody else help fund a little bit of that risk, uh, whether it's gonna be real or not, why we're focused on probably the bigger opportunities for, for farmers and our competitors, not, or, or for, for our company. Uh, now, after saying that, I, I will tell you even big ticket items, you know, it's, it's rare that there's a, a single entity that creates a complete solution, right? A lot of times you're putting together multiple pieces from, from different com companies or components. And so even there, we might say, well, look, we need X to really make this whole solution work. And so if we don't have it, how do we go out and license it uh, or work with somebody in collaboration to, to get it? And then we can put that together with the other pieces that we already have. So um, I'd tell you it's across the board, but um, you know, we're gonna look to what complements to our targets and our strategy. And then we're gonna look to where um, for those things that are just below the line, we can't afford that we can go out and collaborate and, and bring those into the company. Got it, got it. You know, you said a word, um, I, you might have tried to grab it back, competition, right? <laughs> you might try to grab that back. You know, honestly, sometimes I think about that with other uh, universities as far as students go and things like that. And I, I try to adjust my mindset a bit. You know, it feels that way because we're all driving towards an end goal. But when you think about it, and I think uh, Angela Green uh, brought this up in the last session, I said this earlier this morning, like sometimes I, I wish we could just reveal all that we knew so we could take on the grand challenges and solve them, you know? And, you know, we're, we're in a situation where there's a lot of fear and, and concern about doing that. When you look at some of the big problems in ag, what would it take? Is there an incentive that would bring big companies together to share knowledge in a way that would explode the potential to solve the problems. I mean, I, I would love to figure out how to do that in my own arena, but I think about it a lot. Like what, 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 is, what is the incentive that would get us to go there? You know, yeah, it's a, it's a great point. And um, to your, your, your to core of your question, you know, sometimes competition gets in the way of, of that. Um, you know, one of the things that, that uh, we've started at Corteva is what we call uh, radical openness. Mm -hmm. where we're, we're taking certain major areas. We, we actually started with our plant breeding program. We've done this on gene editing. We're, we're actually just now internally reviewing the next set of projects you know, that we go there where we're, we're, we're trying to change that paradigm a little bit and open up and say, hey, here's what we're doing, right? Here's how we see it. Here's how we think about it. Um, how do we continue to partner in the industry and, and with a lot of the startups? Because we know we can't, you know, solve these things by ourselves. And um, I, I look at some of the big sustainability and climate change challenges ahead of us. And again, I just, those are not things that individual companies are gonna go, go solve. And we really do need a, a true coalition and collaboration across the entire industry, right? If you think about how are we effectively gonna sequester carbon in agriculture fields, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things to solve there, uh, a lot of things to work out. And, and uh, so you'd love to have one where, okay, you know, uh, how do we all work together to make that one successful for our farmers, 
and successful for the environment. Um, but it, it can be can be tough. Uh, I fully appreciate that. But we're we're trying to be more open and uh, more transparent in what we're doing. Absolutely, I appreciate that. You know, earlier one of the speakers was talking about context. Context in agriculture really matters. You know, it's so so true because all the solutions that we apply are really, it's never one size fits all, right? You know, there's right. so many factors that influence what we do. I think as we go on, it's gonna be interesting to see how context creates awareness about opportunity to collaborate differently, right? Because, you know, yep. context creates different opportunities for all of us. So you can work on that with industry and I'll work on that with my colleagues at uh, Land Grants. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, a great one for that is you think about gene editing, right? I mean. Yeah. I mean, there's not a plant geneticist or a plant breeder or scientist out there that wouldn't talk about the opportunity and the value of it. You know, we got tremendous research going on at the universities, with startups, with companies. Uh, yeah, we've got barriers about uh, you know, acceptance and regulatory. So you know, it's a great example of how do you bring together the whole industry, large companies, uh, small companies, to university scientists, uh, startups to say, hey, hey, we need to educate and we need to move acceptance so that, you know, this is some technology that gets to really blossom versus, you know, kind of die on the vine uh, like some other technology. So, you know, how do we work together in that, right? This is really what we should be asking ourselves. Yeah, absolutely, I appreciate that very much. So Laura mentioned that you have a couple sites in the research park, and can you talk to us a little bit about the value of that, and you know how it helps you recruit and connect to the science, and maybe some things you've learned about best management practices for managing you know companies uh, sites in the research park. You know the the research park, and you know I've said this before. I mean, what a what a phenomenal. Uh, uh, sort of a arrangement and asset in, in many ways, right? Not only from the, the innovation and research that's going on, but the, the students that uh, are getting trained at it and coming through it. I always kind of wondered if, if the research park was there when I was a student, you know, how would my trajectory have changed at the end of the day? It would be kind of one of those neat sort of experiments to go run. Maybe we can get the supercomputer sort of simulate that for me. Um, but the, uh, I, you know, from a, from a talent point of view, it's, it's critical. Um, you know, it's a great way to get a chance for us to look at students, for those students to get a chance to look at us. You know, what is the company that, you know, who, who are we? What do we stand for? What's our values? What are the projects we're trying to work on? Uh, it's a chance for students to kind of get a feel for what it might be to work in a private sector and, you know, the good and the bad that comes with that at times. And, and you know, really experience it at the end of the day. So I, I've been extremely impressed with it and continue to support it and we'll continue to support it through Corteva. I, you know, we've got multiple sites there. I, I know we're looking at how do we, uh, you know, use those more and uh, expand those opportunities, maybe even consolidate it down and get some synergies, but uh, making sure we got a strong presence there, both for, for granular and also the broader R&D organization that's doing a lot of digital work and, um, you know, sort of digital activities, not only, you know, plant breeding and crop protection, but, you know, how do we use data inside of our R&D development program? So uh, excited about it. And, you know, I think best practices that, that I've seen are, you know, the on-site manager is key, right? They're really the face of the company and the connection to students. And so, uh, that's a quality role that uh, needs to be able to go talk at the company level, but go talk to students at the same time. And then um, making sure you got projects that are definable, that a student can clearly work on, can kind of see progress, uh, can see some results, uh, let them have the ability to talk about it. So they got freedom to use it in, in their uh, resumes and, and job searches going forward. And um, yeah, you know, it, uh, if, you, if you do that, it, it's quite successful from what I've seen. Awesome, very good. Uh, we have a couple questions that came into the Q&A, if you don't mind, um, I'm gonna yeah. ask you those. Um, what is the future of gene editing in ag? Well, I hope it's bright. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think from the, the technology point of view, I mean, Gosh, I, I look at the stuff we've reduced to practice at Corteva. Um, it's just phenomenal. Uh, you look at um, 
some of the product concepts where you could go create and do stuff that, you know, as much as I love plant breeding and uh, believe in the power of it, um, you know, gene editing offers some opportunities that we struggled with as plant breeders. And so, uh, and if you think about crops where in general, we have a, a society, um, you know, invested as much into, you know, from a plant breeding or, you know, a technology point of view, what a, what a great opportunity to expand genetic variability and, and uh, use that tool to improve those crops. Um, but again, it comes back to you know, the, the regulatory uh, environment's one part, and then you know, social acceptance is the other part. And you know, I, as I challenge my organization, say, look, we, we have to learn from what happened with biotech and uh, not let this be biotech you know, take two. Uh, we really have to change the trajectory of this to be you know, a little different. And so we need to get after those conversations and helping people understand so we can change that trajectory. Because today I tell you, you know, it's still a fairly significant blocker in that technology being used at, at scale in production agriculture. It's still being used obviously in research and some closed loop systems, but um, if it really is gonna have a big impact, we gotta get it out there on more acres. Sure, sure. So um, there are two questions that are actually similar from a little bit of a different bent, and they have to deal, they have to do with kind of communication resistance. So one is about resistance is one of the main challenges to people um, taking advantage of pesticides and seeds. That would be true for gene editing as well. Yeah. How do you overcome that from an international bent? Uh, the example here is Brazil. The second question, which is similar, you talked a little bit about straightening out this conversation gap between, you know, agricultural practitioners and consumers. Uh, do you have strategies at the company to help take that on that might shorten that disconnect? Because, you know, we can develop all kinds of amazing things. And if people won't use them, they go to waste. Yep. Yeah. And again, I spoke to this a little earlier that as scientists, we all tend to think data should you know, be the conversation and data is going to influence everybody's decision and understanding. And, and again, I think we've seen that that, that just may not be the case. Um, so I, I, I've always, the way I've been thinking about it is, you know, we, we've got to get to common ground of what we're trying to accomplish, right? You know, what, what is it that consumers want, right? And again, I'll use the example of, of carbon, right? Where Look, we, we need to impact uh, what's going on with our climate. And one of the things we all believe is how do we you know, bring more carbon out of the system? Uh, and uh, you know, really, how do we sequester carbon you know, maybe as an agriculture tool? All right, so if that's our real ultimate goal. Then what are all the tools and technologies that can help us achieve that? And, and getting people to understand that there's no perfect solution on any of this, right? It just, it's sort of like, you know, the plant breeding dilemma, right? I mean, I'm going to get that perfect variety or perfect hybrid. No, you're not, right? There's, there's always going to be some weakness or problem uh, that you're going to have to deal with in whatever you do, but you're, con you're, you're moving things forward holistically as a, as a plant breeding group. And I think the same thing has to be here about how we, how we think about this technology is, how does it fundamentally move us forward and the big goals, big challenges we're trying to solve? Uh, and, and can we get aligned on that? And, and I think that's the way we have to approach these conversations um, versus, hey, let me prove you wrong with all my data, which is probably the approach we've used in the past. Um, so, you know, find the common ground. Let's get aligned on what we're trying to accomplish. Let's, let's show how the different pieces can do that. And, then, you know, there's probably compromises we all need to make. Right? I mean, for example, uh, you know, there, there's maybe certain things we shouldn't do with gene editing. And, you know, can we all agree to that and align with that, that uh, would make consumers uh, more comfortable with it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the stuff we need to explore. You know, there's a conversation on campus that's live in the moment about um, science communication. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really our responsibility to do a better job of training people in this arena you and I kind of grew up in the same era, and I can't say this was a big part of my educational portfolio. Do you think we yeah. need to do better there? You know, being smart yeah. may not be enough. We need to actually support people with the skills to communicate what they know in an effective way, no matter who the audience is. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. Um, I, I kind of laugh at this one because I, uh, 
you know, again, as, as scientists, you know, especially if you're, you're trained with advanced degrees, you know, what is our communication method is the right technical papers, right? Mm -hmm. The technical, uh, you know, journal article uh, reviewers review and critique you on your, you know, aspects of your experiment and your conclusions. And, um, and I've just seen numerous times where, again, incredibly talented scientists will say, well, go read the paper. And I just, it just doesn't work for society, right? It's just not the way to connect to them. And so we, we do have to think about how to tell our story uh, from a legitimate point of view, right? It doesn't mean we're, we need to take it and, and make it so simple that it's no longer valid. Uh, but, but we have to put it in a way that relates to what people care about. Again, common ground that we're all working on. Uh, a way they can uh, kind of understand it in a quick soundbite, unfortunately, um, and and not, you know, try to grind on a lot of data and technical issues at the end of the day. So yeah, I, I think there is a real need there for uh, how do we all do it better. And it, it's something that I I constantly am learning about how to how to best communicate and and explain stuff to people. I agree. I think some of the biggest challenges I have are in that arena. When I do it well, it's great. When I don't do it well, it's not good. Yeah, yep. So absolutely. Um, I'm going to close with this last question. So you mentioned the $26 billion that have been uh, invested in, um, you know, biotech, ag, ag food tech companies in 2020. It's an incredible amount of money. Uh, what would you tell people about investing resources in biotech for today and the future? Uh, you know, clearly uh, people still believe in it, if you look at that number. So um, it's great to see, uh, I mean, a lot of uh, excitement in the ag tech sector, ag food sector, a lot of belief that we can continue to innovate and improve uh, what we have. Um, uh, I, I would just, you know, if I was an investor and telling people again, you know, uh, look at what you think is uh, real, make sure you kind of understand the problem Make sure you understand, you know, what some of the solutions are being proposed. You probably got to accept that timelines might be a little longer than you'd like. Um, there's more barriers and hurdles that you probably got to go through in, a, in an ag sector that maybe you don't have to do in other sectors. Um, and, and you've got to think about how this um, uh, consumer acceptance is really going to play into to the technology point of view. And, you know, I mean, whether it's even a, an AI model that's helping do something, right? I mean, we're, we're clearly going to get pushback on how we use AI and how we're using data and data privacy and who owns the data. And, you know, we're just at the beginning of those sort of issues. So um, it is, I think it's across the board in technology. So, so I, I tell investors, make sure you look at the whole picture there. Very good. Well, gosh, thank you so much for your time. You know, we're so proud of you as, a, as an alum of the college and our relationship with you is fabulous. We're excited about what happens next uh, in your role with Corteva, but thanks so much for your time. Uh, you inspired me. That's a good thing, let alone all these people that are listening. So thanks so Very much. Good. All right, you. thank you, Cam. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Dean Kidwell. Um, appreciate having you back, Sam, another Ag Tech Summit.